This is section 55 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Postprandial Oratory. Forefathers' Day Dinner, Congregational Club, Music Hall, Boston, December 20th, 1887. Read by John Greenman. In treating of this subject of postprandial oratory, a subject which I have long been familiar with, and may be called an expert in observing it in others, I wish to say that a public dinner is the most delightful thing in the whole world to a guest. That is one fact. And here is another one. A public dinner is the most un utterable suffering in the whole world to a guest these two facts don't seem to jibe but i will explain now at a public dinner when a man knows he is going to be called upon to speak and is thoroughly well prepared got it all by heart and the pauses all marked in his head where the applause is going to come in a public dinner is just heaven to that man. He won't care to be anywhere else than just where he is. But when at a public dinner it is getting way along toward the end of things, and a man is sitting over his glass of wine or his glass of milk, according to the kind of banquet it is, in ever augmenting danger of being called up, and isn't prepared, and knows he can never prepare with the thoughtless gander at his elbow bothering him all the time with exasperating talky talk about nothing, that man is just as nearly in the other place as ever he wants to be. Why, it is a cruel situation. That man is to be pitied and the very worst of it is that the minute he gets on his feet he is pitied now we could stand the pity of ten people or a dozen but there is no misery in the world that is comparable to the massed and solidified compassion of five hundred why that wide sahara of sympathizing faces completely takes the tuck out of him, makes a coward of him. He stands there in his misery and stammers out the usual rubbish about not being prepared and not expecting and all that kind of folly, and he is wandering and stumbling and getting further and further in, and all the time unhappy, and at last he fetches out a poor, miserable, crippled joke and in his grief and confusion he laughs at it himself, and the others look sick, and then he slumps into his chair and wishes he was dead. He knows he is a defeated man, and so do the others. Now to a humane person that is a heart-rending spectacle. It is indeed that sort of sacrifice ought to be stopped and there is only one way to accomplish it that i can think of and that is for a man to go always prepared always loaded always ready whether he is likely to be called upon or not you can't defeat that man you can't pity him at all my scheme is this that he shall carry in his head a cut-and-dried and thoroughly and glibly memorized speech that will fit every conceivable public occasion in this life, fit it to a dot, and win success and applause every time. Now I have completed a speech of that kind, and I have brought it along to exhibit here as a sample. Now then, supposing a man with his cut-and-dried speech this patent adjustable speech as you may call it finds himself at a granger gathering or a wedding breakfast or a theological disturbance or a political blowout an inquest or funeral 
anywhere in the world you choose to mention and be suddenly called up all he has got to do is change three or four words in that speech and make his delivery anguishing and tearful or chippy and facetious or luridly and thunderously eloquent just as the occasion happens to call for and just turn himself loose and he is all right but i will illustrate and instead of explanations i will deliver that speech itself just enough times to make you see the possibilities we suppose that it is a granger gathering and this man is suddenly called on he comes up with some artful hesitancies and diffidences and repetitions so as to give the idea that the speech is impromptu here of course after he has got used to delivering it he can venture outside and make a genuine impromptu remark to start off with for instance if a distinguished person is present he can make a complimentary reference to him say to mr de pew he could speak about his great talent or his clothes such a thing gives him a sort of opening and about the time that audience is getting to pity that man he opens his throttle valve and goes for those grangers that person wants to be gorgeously eloquent you want to fire the farmer's heart and start him from his mansard down to his cellar now this man is called up and he says i am called up suddenly sir and am indeed not not prepared to uh, to uh, i was not expecting to be called up sir uh, but i will with what effect i may add my shout to the jubilations of this spirit-stirring occasion agriculture sir is after all the palladium of our economic liberties by it approximately speaking we may be said to live and move and have our being all that we have been all that we are all that we hope to be was is and must continue to be profoundly influenced by that sublimest of the mighty interests of man thrice glorious agriculture while we have life while we have soul and in that soul the sweet and hallowed sentiment of gratitude let us with generous accord attune our voices to songs of praise perennial outpourings of thanksgiving for that most precious boon whereby we physically thrive whereby our otherwise sterile existence is made rich and strong and grand and aspiring and is adorned with a mighty and far-reaching and all-embracing grace and beauty and purity and loveliness the least of us knows the least of us feels the humblest among us will confess that whereas uh, but the hour is late sir and i will not detain you now then supposing it is not a granger gathering at all but is a wedding breakfast now of course that speech has got to be delivered in an airy light fashion but it must terminate seriously it is a mistake to make it any other way this person is called up by the minister of the feast and he says i am called up suddenly sir and am indeed not prepared to to i was not expecting to be called up sir but i will with what effect i may add my shout to the jubilations of this spirit-stirring occasion matrimony sir is after all the palladium of our domestic liberties by it approximately speaking we may be said to live and move and acquire our being all that we have been all that we are all that we hope to be was is 
and must continue to be profoundly influenced by that sublimest of the mighty interests of man thrice glorious matrimony while we have life while we have soul and in that soul the sweet and hallowed sentiments of gratitude let us with generous accord attune our voices to songs of praise perennial outpourings of thanksgiving for that most precious boon whereby we numerically thrive whereby our otherwise sterile existence is made rich and strong and grand and aspiring and is adorned with a mighty and far-reaching and all-embracing grace and beauty and purity and loveliness the least of us knows the least of us feels the humblest among us will confess that whereas but the hour is late sir and i will not detain you now then supposing that the occasion i make one more illustration so that you will always be perfectly safe here or anywhere supposing that this is an occasion of an inquest this is a most elastic speech in a matter of that kind where there are grades of men you must observe them at a private funeral of some friend you want to be just as mournful as you can but in the case where you don't know the person grade it accordingly you want simply to be impressive that is all now take a case halfway between about number four and a half somewhere about there that is an inquest on a second cousin a wealthy second cousin he has remembered you in the will of course all these things count they all raise the grade a little and well perhaps he hasn't remembered you perhaps he has left you a horse an ordinary horse a, a good enough horse one that can go about three minutes or perhaps a pair of horses it may have been one pair of horses at hand not two pair or two pair and a jack i don't know whether you understand that but there are people here well now then this is a second cousin and he knows all the circumstances we will say that he has lost his life trying to save somebody from drowning well he saved the mind cure physician from drowning he tried to save him but he didn't succeed of course he wouldn't succeed of course you wouldn't want him to succeed in that way and plan a person must have some experience and aplomb and all that before he can save anybody from drowning of the mind cure i am just making these explanations here a person can get so glib in a delivery of this speech why by the time he has delivered it fifteen or twenty times he could go to any intellectual gathering in boston even and he would draw like a prize fight well at the inquest of a second cousin under these circumstances a man gets up with graded emotion and he says i am called up suddenly sir and am indeed uh, not prepared to to well, i was not expecting to be called up sir but i will with what effect i may add my shout voice to the lamentations of this spirit crushing occasion death death sir is after all the palladium of our spiritual liberties by it approximately speaking we may be said to live and move and have our ending all that we have been all that we may be here all that we hope to be was is and must continue to be profoundly influenced by that sublimest of the mighty interests of man thrice sorrowful disillusion while we have life while we have soul 
and in that soul the sweet and hallowed sentiment of gratitude let us with generous accord attune our voices to songs of praise perennial outpourings of thanksgiving for that most precious boon by which we spiritually thrive whereby our otherwise sterile existence is made rich and strong and grand and aspiring and is adorned with a mighty and far-reaching and all-embracing grace and beauty and purity and loveliness the least of us knows the least of us feels the humblest among us will confess that whereas uh, but the hour is late sir and i will not detain you the speech as used at a funeral may be used to prop up prohibition and also anti-prohibition without change except to change the terms of sorrow to terms of rejoicing the speech as used at a granger meeting may be used in boston at the sacred feast of baked beans without any alteration except to change agriculture where it occurs in the second sentence to the baked bean and to bean culture where it occurs in the fourth the agricultural speech becomes a prohibition speech by putting in that word and changing economic to moral and physically to morally it becomes a democratic republican mugwump or other political speech by shoving in the party name and changing economic to political and physically to politically any of these forms can be used at a new england forefathers dinner they don't care what you talk about so long as it ain't so end of postprandial oratory read by john greenman This is section 56 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Yale College Speech, Yale Alumni Association Banquet, Footguard Hall, Hartford, February 6, 1889. Read by John Greenman. The editor believes that this is one of two discarded speeches, and at the event Mr. Twain spoke informally. I was sincerely proud and grateful to be made a Master of Arts by this great and venerable university, and I would have come last June to testify this feeling as I do now testify it, but that the sudden and unexpected notice of the honor done me found me at a distance from home, and unable to discharge that duty and enjoy that privilege along at first say for the first month or so i did not quite know how to proceed because of my not knowing just what authorities and privileges belonged to the title which had been granted me but after that i consulted some students of trinity in hartford and they made everything clear to me it was through them that i found out that my title made me head of the governing body of the university and lodged in me very broad and severely responsible powers it is through trying to work these powers up to their maximum of efficiency that i have had such a checkered career this year i was told that it would be necessary for me to report to you at this time and of course i comply though I would have preferred to put it off till I could make a better showing, for indeed I have been so pertinaciously hindered and obstructed at every turn by the faculty that it would be difficult to prove that the university is really in any better shape now than it was when I first took charge. In submitting my report, I am sorry to have to begin with the remark that respect for authority seems to be at a quite low ebb in the college 
it is true that this has caused me pain but it has not discouraged me by advice i turned my earliest attention to the greek department i told the greek professor i had concluded to drop the use of the greek written character because it was so hard to spell with and so impossible to read after you get it spelled let us draw the curtain there i saw by what followed that nothing but early neglect saved him from being a very profane man i ordered the professor of mathematics to simplify the whole system because the way it was i couldn't understand it and i didn't want things going on in the college in what was practically a clandestine fashion i told him to drop the conundrum system it was not suited to the dignity of a college which should deal in facts not guesses and suppositions we didn't want any more cases of if a and b stand at opposite poles of the earth's surface and c at the equator of jupiter at what variations of angle will the left limb of the moon appear to these different parties i said you just let that thing alone it's plenty time to get in a sweat about it when it happens as like as not it ain't going to do any harm anyway his reception of these instructions bordered on insubordination insomuch that i felt obliged to take his number and report him i found the astronomer of the university gadding around after comets and other such odds and ends tramps and derelicts of the skies i told him pretty plainly that we couldn't have that i told him it was no economy to go on piling up and piling up raw material in the way of new stars and comets and asteroids that we couldn't ever have any use for till we had worked off the old stock i said if i caught him strawberrying around after any more asteroids especially i should have to fire him out privately prejudice got the best of me there i ought to confess it at bottom i don't really mind comets so much but somehow i have always been down on asteroids there is nothing mature about them i wouldn't sit up nights the way that man does if i could get a basket full of them he said it was the best line of goods he had he said he could trade them to rochester for comets and trade the comets to harvard for nebulae and trade the nebulae to the smithsonian for flint hatchets i felt obliged to stop this thing on the spot i said we couldn't have the university turned into an astronomical junk shop and while i was at it i thought i might as well make the reform complete the astronomer is extraordinarily mutinous and so with your approval i will transfer him to the law department and put one of the law students in his place a boy will be more biddable more tractable also cheaper it is true he cannot be entrusted with important work at first but he can comb the skies for nebulae till he gets his hand in i have other changes in mind but as they are in the nature of surprises i judge it politic to leave them unspecified at this time end of yale college speech read by john greenman This is section 57 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introducing Edgar Wilson, Bill Nye, and James Whitcomb Riley. Tremont Temple, Boston, February 28, 1889. Read by John Greenman. I am very glad, indeed, to introduce these young people to you, and at the same time get acquainted with them myself i have seen them more than once for a moment but have not had the privilege of knowing them personally as intimately as i wanted to 
i saw them first a great many years ago when mr barnum had them and they were just fresh from siam the ligature was their best hold then but literature became their best hold later when one of them committed an indiscretion and they had to cut the old bond to accommodate the sheriff in that old former time this one was chang and that one was eng the sympathy existing between the two was most extraordinary it was so fine so strong so subtle that what one ate the other digested when one slept the other snored if one sold a thing the other scooped the usufruct this independent and yet dependent action was observable in all the details of their daily life i mean this quaint and arbitrary distribution of originating cause and resulting effect between the two between may i say this dynamo and this motor not that i mean that the one was always dynamo and the other always motor or in other words that the one was always the creating force the other always the utilizing force no no for while it is true that within certain well-defined zones of activity the one was always dynamo and the other always motor within certain other well-defined zones these positions became exactly reversed for instance in moral matters in moral matters mr chang riley was always dynamo uh, mr eng nye was always motor for a while mr chang riley had a high in fact an abnormally high and fine moral sense this man had high moral sense you can see the development all over him now although he had that fine moral sense he hadn't any machinery to work it with whereas mr eng nye who hadn't any moral sense at all and hasn't yet as you will observe later yet had all the necessary plant for the carrying out of the noble deed if he could only get the necessary inspiration on reasonable terms outside now then again you see the thing reversed in intellectual matters mr eng nye was always the dynamo mr chang riley was always the motor mr eng nye had a stately intellect but couldn't make it go and at the same time mr chang riley hadn't but could that is to say that while mr chang riley couldn't think things himself he had a marvelous natural grace in setting them down and weaving them together when his pal furnished the raw material so they worked together in that way thus working together they made a strong team laboring together they could do miracles but break the circuit and both were impotent at once it has remained so to this day they must travel together conspire together beguile together hoe and plant and plow and reap and sell their public together or there's no result i have made this explanation this analysis this fire assay this vivisection so to speak in order that you may enjoy these delightful adventurers understandingly now while mr eng nye is drawing a limpid stream of philosophy that flows over and refreshes the region all around with his gracious flood you remember that it is not his water it is the other man's he's only working the pump and when mr chang riley enchants your ear and 
soothes your spirit and touches your heart with the sweet and tender music of his voice as sweet and as genuine as any that his friends the birds and the bees sang to his other friends the woods and the flowers you will remember to place him where justice would put him it's not his music it's the other man's he is only turning the crank i beseech for these visitors a fair field a single-minded one-eyed umpire and a score bulletin barren of goose eggs if they earn it and i judge they will and hope they will mr james whitcomb chang riley will now go to the bat end of introducing edgar wilson bill nye and james whitcomb riley read by john greenman This is section 58 of Mark Twain's Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Long Clam. Supper for Edwin Booth, Delmonico's, New York, March 30, 1889. Read by John Greenman. Although I am debarred from making a speech by circumstances which I will presently explain, I yet claim the privilege of adding my voice to yours in deep and sincere welcome and homage to Edwin Booth, of adding my admiration of his long and illustrious career and blemishless character, and thereto my gratification in the consciousness that his great son is not yet westering, but stands in full glory in the zenith. I wish to ask your attention to a statement, in writing. It is not safe or wise to trust a serious matter to off-hand speech, especially when you are trying to explain a thing. Now, to make a clean breast, and expose the whole trouble right at the start, I have been entertaining a stranger." i have been at it two days and two nights and am worn and jaded and in fact defeated he may be known to some of you he is classified in natural history as the long clam and in my opinion is the most disastrous fish that swims the sea if you don't know him personally let him alone take him at hearsay and meddle no further he is a bivalve when in his ulster he is shaped like a weaver's shuttle but there the resemblance ends the weaver's shuttle travels but the long clam abides and you can digest a weaver's shuttle if you wait and pray it is your idea of course to entertain yourself with the long clam so you lay him on a bed of coals he opens his mouth like a carpet sack and smiles uh, this looks like mutual regard and you think you are friends but it is not so that smile means it is your innings now i'll see you later you swallow the long clam and history begins it begins but it begins so remotely so clandestinely that you don't know it you have several hours which you can't tell from repose then you go to bed you close your eyes and think you are gliding off to sleep it is at this point that the long clam rises up and goes to bat the window rattles the long clam calls your attention to it you whirl out of bed and wedge the sash the wrong sash you get nearly to sleep the sash rattles again the long clam reminds you you whirl out and pound in some more wedges you plunge into bed with emphasis a sort of bogus unconsciousness begins to dull your brain then some water begins to drip somewhere every drop that falls hurts 
you think you will try mind cure on that drip and so neutralize its effects this causes the long clam to smile you chafe and fret for fifteen minutes then you earthquake yourself out of bed and explore for that drip with a breaking heart and language to match but you never find it when you go to bed this time you understand that your faculties are all up for the night there is business on hand and you have got to superintend the procession begins to move all the crimes you have ever committed and which you supposed you had forgotten file past and every one of them carries a banner the long clam is on hand to comment all the dead and buried indignities you have ever suffered follow they bite like fangs they burn like fire the long clam is getting in his work now he has dug your conscience out and occupied the old stand and you will find that for real business one long clam is worth thirty consciences the rest of that night is slow torture at the stake there are lurid instants at intervals occupied by dreams dreams that stay only half a second but they seem to expose the whole universe and disembowel it before your eyes other dreams that sweep away the solar system and leave the shoreless void occupied from one end to the other by just you and the long clam now you know what it is to sit up with a long clam now you know what it is to try to entertain a long clam now you know what it is to keep a long clam amused to try to keep a long clam from feeling lonesome to try to make a long clam satisfied and happy as for me i would rather go on an orgy with anybody in the world than a long clam i would rather never have any fun at all than try to get it out of a long clam a long clam doesn't know when to stop after you've had all the fun you want the long clam is just getting fairly started in my opinion there is too much company about a long clam a long clam is more sociable than necessary i've got this one along yet it's two days now and this is the third night as far as i've got in all that time i haven't had a wink of sleep that didn't have an earthquake in it or a cyclone or an instantaneous photograph of shoal and so all that is left of me is a dissolving rag or two of former humanity and a fading memory of happier days the rest is long clam that is the explanation that is why i don't make a speech i am perfectly willing to make speeches for myself but i am not going to make speeches for any long clam that ever fluttered not after the way i've been treated not that i don't respect the long clam for i do i consider the long clam by long odds the capablest creature that swims the salt sea i consider the long clam the depew of the watery world just as i consider depew the long clam of the great world of intellect and oratory if any of you find life uneventful lacking variety not picturesque enough for you go into partnership with a long clam end of the long clam read by john greenman This is section 59 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Grand Tour. 1. The Sandwich Islands. Baseball Dinner Delmonico's, New York, April 8, 1889, in which Mark Twain was introduced as a native of the Sandwich Islands.
Read by John Greenman. Though not a native, as intimated by the chairman, I have visited a great many years ago the Sandwich Islands, that peaceful land, that beautiful land, that far off home of profound repose and soft indolence and dreamy solitude where life is one long slumberless sabbath the climate one long delicious summer day and the good that die experience no change for they but fall asleep in one heaven and wake up in another and these boys have played baseball there baseball which is the very symbol the outward and visible expression of the drive and push and rush and struggle of the raging tearing booming nineteenth century one cannot realize it the place and the fact are so incongruous it's like interrupting a funeral with a circus why there's no legitimate point of contact no possible kinship between baseball and the sandwich islands baseball is all fact the islands all sentiment in baseball you've got to do everything just right or you don't get there in the islands you've got to do everything just wrong or you can't stay there you do it wrong to get it right for if you do it right you get it wrong there isn't any way to get it right but to do it wrong and the wronger you do it the righter it is the natives illustrate this every day they never mount a horse from the larboard side they always mount him from the starboard on the other hand they never milk a cow on the starboard side they always milk her on the larboard it's why you see so many short people there they've got their heads kicked off when they meet on the road they don't turn out to the right they turn out to the left and so from always doing everything wrong end first that way it makes them left-handed left-handed and cross-eyed they are all so when a child is born the mother goes right along with her ordinary work without losing half a day it's the father that knocks off and goes to bed till he gets over the circumstances and those natives don't trace descent through the male line but through the female they say they always know who a child's mother was well that odd system is well enough there because there a woman often has as many as six or seven husbands all at the same time and all properly married to her and no blemish about the matter anywhere yet there is no fussing no trouble when a child is born the husbands all meet together in convention in a perfectly orderly way and elect the father and the whole thing is perfectly fair at least as fair as it would be anywhere of course you can't keep politics out but you couldn't do that in any country and so if three of the husbands are republicans and for our democrats it won't make any difference how strong a republican aspect the baby has got that election is going democratic every time and in the matter of that election those poor people stand at the proud altitude of the very highest christian civilization for they know as well as we that all women are ignorant and so they don't allow that mother to vote in those islands the cats haven't any tails and the snakes haven't any teeth and what is still more irregular the man that loses a game gets the pot and as to dress the native women all wear a single garment 
but the men don't no the men don't wear anything at all they hate display when they even wear a smile they think they are overdressed speaking of birds the only bird there that has ornamental feathers has only two just barely enough to squeeze through with and they are under its wings instead of on top of its head where of course they ought to be to do any good the native language is soft and liquid and flexible and in every way efficient and satisfactory till you get mad then there you are there isn't anything in it to swear with good judges all say it is the best sunday language there is but then all the other six days in the week it just hangs idle on your hands it isn't any good for business and you can't work a telephone with it many a time the attention of the missionaries has been called to this defect and they are always promising they are going to fix it but no they go fooling along and fooling along and nothing is done speaking of education everybody there is educated from the highest to the lowest in fact it is the only country in the world where education is actually universal and yet every now and then you run across instances of ignorance that are simply revolting simply degrading to the human race think of it there the ten takes the ace uh, but let us not dwell on such things they make a person ashamed well the missionaries are always going to fix that uh, but they put it off and put it off and put it off and so that nation is going to keep on going down and down and down till some day you will see a pair of jacks beat a straight flush well it is refreshment to the jaded water to the thirsty to look upon men who have so lately breathed the soft airs of those isles of the blest and had before their eyes the inextinguishable vision of their beauty no alien land in all the world has any deep strong charm for me but that one no other land could so longingly and so beseechingly haunt me sleeping and waking through half a lifetime as that one has done other things leave me but it abides other things change but it remains the same for me its balmy airs are always blowing its summer seas flashing in the sun the pulsing of its surf beat is in my ear i can see its garlanded crags its leaping cascades its plumy palms drowsing by the shore its remote summits floating like islands above the cloud rack i can feel the spirit of its woodland solitudes i can hear the plash of its brooks in my nostrils still lives the breath of flowers that perished twenty years ago and these world wanderers who sit before us here have lately looked upon these things and with eyes of flesh not the unsatisfying vision of the spirit i envy them that yes and i would envy them somewhat of the glories they have achieved in their illustrious march about the mighty circumference of the earth if it were fair but no it was an earned run and envy would be out of place i will rather applaud add my hail and welcome to the vast shout now going up from maine to the gulf from the florida keys to frozen alaska out of the throats of the other sixty-five millions of their countrymen they have carried the american name to the uttermost parts of the earth and covered it with glory every time that 
is a service to sentiment but they did the general world a large practical service also a service to the great science of geography ah, think of that we don't talk enough about that don't give it its full value why when these boys started out you couldn't see the equator at all you could walk right over it and never know it was there that is the kind of equator it was such an equator as that isn't any use to anybody as for me i would rather not have any equator at all than a dim thing like that that you can't see but that is all fixed now you can see it now you can't run over it now and not know it's there and so i drink long life to the boys who plowed a new equator round the globe stealing bases on their bellies end of the grand tour number one the sandwich islands read by john greenman this is section sixty of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech fellow craft club dinner new york november fifteenth eighteen eighty nine read by john greenman note twain was introduced as mr samuel langhorne to the surprise and eventual satisfaction to the audience who didn't know who mr langhorne was i am langhorne that is my middle name i am the inventor of the scheme which has been mentioned and i think it is a good one and likely to be of great benefit to the world still this hope may be disappointed and therefore i can't afford to use my real name lest in trying to acquire a new and possibly valuable reputation i destroy the valuable one which i already possess and yet fail to replace it with a new one i propose to take classes and teach under this apparently fictitious name i wish to describe my scheme to you and prove its value by illustration the scheme is founded upon a certain fact a fact which long experience has convinced me is a fact and not a fiction of my imagination that fact is this those speakers who are called upon at a banquet after the regular toasts have been responded to are generally merely called upon by name and requested to get up and talk that is all no text is furnished them and they are in a difficult situation apparently but only apparently the situation is not difficult at all in fact for they are usually men who know that they may be possibly called upon therefore they go to the banquet prepared after a certain fashion the speeches which these volunteers make are all of a pattern they consist of three first-rate anecdotes first water jewels so to speak set in the midst of a lot of rambling and incoherent talk where they flash and sparkle and delight the house the speech is made solely for the sake of the anecdotes whereas they shamelessly pretend that the anecdotes are introduced upon sudden inspiration to illustrate the reasonings advanced in the speech there are no reasonings in the speech the speech wanders along in a random and purposeless way for a while then all of a sudden the speaker breaks out as with an unforeseen and happy inspiration and says how felicitously what i have just been saying is illustrated in the case of the man who uh, then he explodes his first anecdote it's a good one 
so good that a storm of delighted laughter sweeps the house and so disturbs its mental balance for the moment that it fails to notice that the anecdote didn't illustrate what the man had been saying didn't illustrate anything at all indeed but was dragged in by the scruff of the neck and had no relation to the subject which the speaker was pretending to talk about he doesn't allow the laughter to entirely subside before he is off and hammering away at his speech again he doesn't wait because that would be dangerous it would give the house time to reflect then it would see that the anecdote did not illustrate anything he goes flitting airily along in his speech in the same random way as before and presently has another of those inspirations and breaks out again with his how felicitously what i have just been saying is illustrated in the case of the man who then he lets fly his second anecdote and again the house goes down with a crash before it can recover its senses he is away again and cantering gaily toward the home stretch filling the air with a stream of empty words that have no connection with anything and finally he has his third inspiration introduced with the same set form how felicitously what i have just been saying is illustrated in the case of the man who then he lets fly his last and best anecdote and sits down under tempests and earthquakes of laughter and everybody in his neighborhood seizes his hand and shakes it cordially and tells him it was a splendid speech splendid that is my scheme i hope to get classes i shall charge a high rate because the pupil will need but one lesson by grace of a single lesson i will make it possible for the novice who has never faced an audience in his life to rise to his feet upon call without trepidation or embarrassment and make an impromptu speech upon any subject that can be mentioned without preparation of any kind and also without even any knowledge of the subjects which may be chosen for him he shall always be ready for he shall always have his three anecdotes in his pocket written on a card and thus equipped he shall never fail i beg you to give me a text and let me prove what i have been saying any text any subject will do all subjects are alike under my system give me a text after noisy discussion it was proposed that every man write a subject on a slip of paper and drop it in a hat the hat was passed up to the chairman who drew out a slip on which the topic was portrait painting it is a good enough text i want no better i've already told you that all texts are alike under this noble system all that i need to do now is to talk a straight and uninterrupted stream of irrelevancies which shall ostensibly deal learnedly and instructively with the subject of portrait painting the stream must not break anywhere i must never hesitate for a word because under this scheme the orator that hesitates is lost it can give the house a chance to collect its reasoning faculties and that is a thing which must not happen portrait painting that's a good subject for a speech a very good subject indeed portrait painting is an ancient and honorable art and there are many interesting things to say about it yes it's an ancient and honorable art although i don't really know how ancient it is i never heard that adam ever sat for his portrait but maybe he did maybe he did but i don't know and how felicitously what i have just been saying 
is illustrated in the case of the man who reached home at two o'clock in the morning and his wife said plaintively oh john when you've had whiskey enough why don't you ask for sarsaparilla and he said why maria when i have had whiskey enough i can't say sarsaparilla maybe there never was a portrait of adam even if painting is an ancient and honorable art it may not be as ancient as all that and i don't think i ever saw a portrait of any of those old hebrews or of the greeks either but the romans did have portraits carved mostly not painted i've never seen a painted portrait of julius caesar but i can recall more than one statue and how felicitously what i have just been saying is illustrated in the case of the man who arrived at his home at that unusual unfortunate hour in the super early morning and stood there and watched his portico rising and sinking and swaying and reeling and at last when it swung round into his neighborhood he made a plunge and scrambled up the steps and got safely on to the portico stood there watching his dim house rise and fall and swing and sway until the front door came his way and he made a plunge and got it and scrambled up the long flight of stairs but at the topmost step instead of planting his foot upon it he only caught it with his toe and down he tumbled and rolled and thundered all the way down the stairs fetched up in a sitting posture on the bottom step with his arm braced around the friendly newel post and said god pity the poor sailors out at sea on such a night as this but when we come down a little later we do find portraits in rome portraits of the old popes and in germany we find portraits of their opponents calvin and luther there's a portrait of luther in one of those galleries that lingers in my mind as one of the most masterly revelations of character that i ever saw and speaking of luther there was a man in hartford who had a cat called luther third anecdote unreported and that's all i know about portrait painting at least it's all i have time to tell you this evening it is an ancient and honorable art and i'm very glad indeed that you have given me the opportunity of talking to you about it end of dinner speech read by john greenman this is section sixty one of mark twain speaking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview Hartford, early December, 1889 Read by John Greenman The reporter, commenting on Mark Twain's efforts on behalf of good copyright law, mentioned the bill introduced by Senator Jonathan Chase of Rhode Island, which had failed to pass in the previous session of Congress. Had the same party been in power, i would have gone to washington with the boys but i don't know the feeling of the present congress and i have not much faith in a republican congress anyway they are more likely to slap on more protection where it isn't needed than to pass a measure which would do some good everyone ought to get value for his labor whether he makes boots or manuscripts the reporter asked what do you think of the opinion held by an eminent american author that american literature is now on its legs and does not need protection since it has survived and overcome competition with pirated reprints that is true as far as it goes but it does not go far enough 
publishers as it happens are constructed out of pretty much the same material as other people and they are not likely to pay a royalty on a book by an unknown american author when they can get works by established authors for nothing i may as well speak out on this question a month ago i wouldn't have done it but now yes i will speak out this then understand is not simply a question of protecting american authors what becomes of them whether they live or die is of no consequence it is not merely a question of copyright it is a question of maintaining in america a national literature of preserving national sentiment national politics national thought and national morals what becomes of a dozen chuckle-headed authors who can go and saw wood if they like is the merest trifle compared with the great colossal national stakes involved we are fed on a foreign literature and imbibe foreign ideas but if i were to go to england and write down what i think of their monarchical shams pour out my utter contempt for their pitiful lords and dukes and preach my sermon i would not be able to get my views published no english publisher would do it but if a foreigner comes along here and after looking around for a few minutes goes home and writes a book abusing our president and reviling our institutions his views are published and his book is gobbled up by american publishers and circulated throughout the country for twenty cents a copy foreigners after that tell us that we are thin-skinned you americans are very thin-skinned they say our skin is not so very thin but it would be tough if it were not lacerated by such things as these and then our newspapers are abused we are told that they are irreverent coarse vulgar ribald i hope they will remain irreverent i would like that irreverence to be preserved in america forever and ever irreverence for all royalties and all those titled creatures born into privilege merit alone should constitute the one title to eminence and we americans can afford to look down and spit upon miserable titled non-entities but i am sorry that some of our newspapers are losing their irreverence they publish too much about that puppet of an emperor in germany and this dissemination of foreign literature is affecting our women there are women in america and perfectly respectable women who are ready to sell themselves to anything bearing the name of duke indignation over sham nobility led to a discussion of mark twain's forthcoming book a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court i want to get at the englishman but in order to do that i must deal with the english publisher and the english publishers are cowards and so are the english newspapers i have had to modify and modify my book to suit the english publisher's taste until i really cannot cut it any more i talked to mr osgood about it and he said that there was only one publisher in london that would take my book as i wanted to leave it and that house was not quite reputable i've got to have a respectable house and mr osgood said that my london publisher mr chatto was one of the bravest of them yes mr chatto will do the best he can but he will cut my book 
all i could do was to appeal to him to cut it as little as possible i am anxious to know my fate i see that he has cut my preface yes more than half of my preface is gone and all because of a little playful remark of mine about the divine right of kings the reporter asked how long were you at work on this book mr clemens i projected it four years ago and it has been in manuscript for three years i put it in pigeonholes and took it out now and then to see how it was getting on and replaced it again i began to think several months ago that it was about ripe and that the times were about ripe for it and sure enough it was for there is brazil gets rid of her emperor in twenty-four hours and there is talk of a republic in portugal and in australia and curiously enough the proclamation of the brazilian republicans is very similar i mean in the idea not the words to that which my hero issues abolishing the monarchy there was a discussion of mark twain's books and of pirated english editions during which mark twain said of the british pirate john camden hotton i should like very much to blow mr hotton's brains out not that i have any objection to mr hotton but just to see then the reporter changed the subject by asking are you pestered with autograph fiends <laughs> yes i get my share of them i write out a few hundred cards now and then and give them to my secretary to mail when i sent them myself i used to discriminate i would not send my autograph unless the applicants sent addressed envelopes no matter whether they sent a thousand cards or a hundred thousand stamps if they didn't write the address i gobbled their stamps and kept my autograph after an upstairs visit to the billiard room and a great deal of unreported talk by mark twain the reporter asked a final question and when may we expect another book i don't know i don't write the book a book writes itself if there is another book in me it will come out and i will put it on paper end of interview read by john greenman this is section sixty two of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain the christening yarn often used from about eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety in which mark twain plays the part of an officiating minister at a christening read by john greenman ah my friends he is but a little fellow a very little fellow yes a very little fellow but with a severe glance around what of that i ask you what of that from this point gradually begin to rise and soar and be pathetic and impassioned and all that is it a crime to be little is it a crime that you cast upon him these cold looks of disparagement oh reflect my friends reflect oh if you but had the eye of poesy which is the eye of prophecy you would fling your gaze afar down the stately march of his possible future and then what might ye not see what ye disparage him because he is little oh consider the mighty ocean ye may spread upon its shoreless bosom the white-winged fleets of all the nations and lo they are but as a flock of insects lost in the awful vacancies of interstellar space yet the mightiest ocean is made of little things drops tiny little drops each no bigger 
than the tear that rests upon the cheek of this poor child and oh my friends consider the mountain ranges the giant ribs that girdle the great globe and hold its frame together and what are they compacted grains of sand little grains of sand each no more than a freight for a gnat and oh consider the constellations the flashing suns countless for multitude that swim the stupendous deeps of space glorifying the midnight skies with their golden splendors what are they compacted motes specks impalpable atoms of wandering star-dust arrested in their vagrant flight and welded into solid worlds little things yes they are made of little things and he oh look at him little is he and ye would disparage him for it oh i beseech you cast the eye of poesy which is the eye of prophecy into his future why he may become a poet the grandest the world has ever seen homer shakespeare dante compacted into one and send down the procession of the ages songs that shall contest immortality with human speech itself or he may become a great soldier the most illustrious in the annals of his race napoleon caesar alexander compacted into one and carry the victorious banner of his country from sea to sea and from land to land until it shall float at last unvexed over the final stronghold of a conquered world o oh, heir of imperishable renown or he may become a a he he struggle desperately here to think of something else that he may become but without success the audience getting more and more distressed and worried about you all the time he may become he suddenly but what is his name papa with impatience and exasperation his name is it well his name's mary ann End of the Christening Yarn Read by John Greenman This is section 63 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Curtain Speech Opening of The Prince and the Pauper Broadway Theatre, New York, January 20, 1890 Read by John Greenman for fifteen years i have had in my mind's eye such an idol as we have seen this evening years ago i went to an old friend of mine and told him the story of the prince and the pauper he didn't know stop that hammering back there this to some stage hands who were making a dreadful racket behind the drop he didn't know anything about dramatic affairs he was without bias and he said it would make a rattling play he used some other phrase that i forget just now but it was strong and convincing so i went home and started to write the play somehow i couldn't make it go i had written books and knew i could write books as well as anyone but i couldn't make the play i found that it required qualities to make a play different from those needed to write a book to write a book one must have great learning high moral qualities and some other little things like that but to make a play requires genius 
so i spread my story out in a book and waited for the genius to come along to do the dramatizing and therefore the honor of this curtain call belongs not to me but to mrs abby sage richardson who i regret to say is not in the house tonight or even in the city end of curtain speech read by john greenman this is section sixty four of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain on foreign critics dinner for max orell everett house boston april twenty seventh eighteen ninety read by john greenman if i look harried and worn it is not from an ill conscience it is from sitting up nights to worry about the foreign critic he won't concede that we have a civilization a real civilization five years ago he said we had never contributed anything to the betterment of the world and now comes sir lepel griffin whom i had not suspected of being in the world at all and says there is no country calling itself civilized where one would not rather live than in america except russia that settles it that is it settles it for europe but it doesn't make me any more comfortable than i was before what is a real civilization nobody can answer that conundrum they have all tried then suppose we try to get at what it is not and then subtract the what it is not from the general sum and call the remainder real civilization so as to have a place to stand on while we throw bricks at these people let us say then in broad terms that any system which has in it any one of these things to it human slavery despotic government inequality numerous and brutal punishments for crimes superstition almost universal ignorance almost universal and dirt and poverty almost universal is not a real civilization and any system which has none of them is if you grant these terms one may then consider this conundrum how old is real civilization the answer is easy and unassailable a century ago it had not appeared anywhere in the world during a single instant since the world was made if you grant these terms and i don't see why it shouldn't be fair since civilization must surely mean the humanizing of a people not a class there is today but one real civilization in the world and it is not yet thirty years old we made the trip and hoisted its flag when we disposed of our slavery however there are some partial civilizations scattered around over europe pretty lofty civilizations they are too but who begot them what is the seed from which they sprang liberty and intelligence what planted that seed there are dates and statistics which suggest that it was the american revolution that planted it when that revolution began monarchy had been on trial some thousands of years over there and was a distinct and convicted failure every time it had never produced anything but a vast a nearly universal savagery with a thin skim of civilization on top and the main part of that was nickel-plate and tinsel the french 
imbruted and impoverished by centuries of oppression and official robbery were a starving nation clothed in rags slaves of an aristocracy of smirking dandies clad in unearned silks and velvet it makes one's cheek burn to read of the laws of the time and realize that they were for human beings realize that they originated in this world and not in hell germany was unspeakable in the scottish lowlands the people lived in styes and were human swine in the highlands drunkenness was general and it hardly smirched a young girl to have a family of her own in england there was a sham liberty and not much of that crime was general ignorance the same poverty and misery were widespread london fed a tenth of her population by charity the law awarded the death penalty to almost every conceivable offence what was called medical science by courtesy stood where it had stood for two thousand years tom jones and squire western were gentlemen the printer's art had been known in germany and france three and a quarter centuries and in england three in all that time there had not been a newspaper in europe that was worthy the name monarchies had no use for that sort of dynamite when we hoisted the banner of revolution and raised the first genuine shout for human liberty that had ever been heard this was a newspaperless globe eight years later there were six daily journals in london to proclaim to all the nations the greatest birth this world had ever seen who woke that printing press out of its trance of three hundred years let us be permitted to consider that we did it who summoned the french slaves to rise and set the nation free we did it what resulted in england and on the continent crippled liberty took up its bed and walked from that day to this its march has not halted and please god it never will we are called the nation of inventors and we are we could still claim that title and wear its loftiest honors if we had stopped with the first thing we ever invented which was human liberty out of that invention has come the christian world's great civilization without it it was impossible as the history of all the centuries has proved well then who invented civilization even sir lepel griffin ought to be able to answer that question it looks easy enough we have contributed nothing nothing hurts me like ingratitude yes the coveted verdict has been persistently withheld from us mr arnold granted that our whole people including by especial mention that immense class the great bulk of the community the wage and salary earners have liberty equality plenty to eat plenty to wear comfortable shelter high pay abundance of churches newspapers libraries charities and a good education for everybody's child for nothing he added society seems organized there for their benefit benefit of the bulk and mass of the people yes it is conceded that we furnish the greatest good to the greatest number and so all we lack is a civilization mr arnold's indicated civilization would seem to be restricted by its narrow lines and difficult requirements 
to a class a top class as in tropical countries snow is restricted to the mountain summits and from what one may gather from his rather vague and unsure analysis of it the snow metaphor would seem to fit it in more ways than one the impression you get of it is that it is peculiarly hard and glittering and bloodless and unattainable now if our bastard were a civilization it could fairly be figured by mr arnold's own concessions by the circulation of the blood which nourishes and refreshes the whole body alike delivering its rich streams of life and health impartially to the imperial brain and the meanest extremity end of on foreign critics read by john greenman this is section sixty five of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech national wholesale druggists association banquet washington d c circa september eighteen ninety read by john greenman about a thousand years ago approximately i was apprenticed to a printer's devil to learn the trade in common with three other boys of about my own age there came to the village a long-legged individual of about nineteen from one of the interior counties fish-eyed no expression and without the suggestion of a smile couldn't have smiled for a salary we took him for a fool and thought we would try to scare him to death we went to the village druggist and borrowed a skeleton the skeleton didn't belong to the druggist but he had imported it for the village doctor because the doctor thought he would send away for it having some delicacy about using the price of a skeleton at that time was fifty dollars i don't know how high they go now but probably higher on account of the tariff we borrowed the skeleton about nine o'clock at night and we got this man nicodemus dodge was his name we got him downtown out of the way and then we put the skeleton in his bed he lived in a little one-storied log cabin in the middle of a vacant lot we left him to get home by himself we enjoyed the result in the light of anticipation but by and by we began to drop into silence the possible consequences were preying upon us suppose that it frightens him into madness overturns his reason and sends him screeching through the streets we shall spend sleepless nights the rest of our days everybody was afraid by and by it was forced to the lips of one of us that we had better go at once and see what had happened loaded down with crime we approached that hut and peeped through the window that long-legged critter was sitting on his bed with a hunk of gingerbread in his hand and between the bites he played a tune on a jew's harp there he sat perfectly happy and all around him on the bed were toys and gimcracks and striped candy the darn cuss he had gone and sold that skeleton for five dollars the druggist's fifty-dollar skeleton was gone we went in tears to the druggist and explained the matter we couldn't have raised that fifty dollars in two hundred and fifty years we were getting board and clothing for the first year clothing and board for the second year and both of them for the third year the druggist forgave us on the spot but he said he would like us to let him have our skeletons when we were done with them 
there couldn't be anything fairer than that we spouted our skeletons and went away comfortable uh, but from that time the druggist's prosperity ceased this was one of the most unfortunate speculations he ever went into after some years one of the boys went and got drowned and that was one skeleton gone and i tell you the druggist felt pretty badly about it a few years after another of the boys went up in a balloon he was to get five dollars an hour for it when he gets back they will be owing him one million dollars the druggist's property was decreasing right along after a few more years the third boy tried an experiment to see if a dynamite charge would go it went all right they found some of him perhaps a vest pocketful still it was enough to show that some more of that estate had gone the druggist was getting along in years and he commenced to correspond with me i have been the best correspondent he has he is the sweetest natured man i ever saw always mild and polite and never wants to hurry me at all i get a letter from him every now and then and he never refers to my form as a skeleton says well how is it getting along is it in good repair i got a night rate message from him recently said he was getting old and the property was depreciating in value and if i could let him have a part of it now he would give time on the balance think of the graceful way in which he does everything the generosity of it all you cannot find a finer character than that it is the gracious characteristic of all druggists so out of my heart i wish you all prosperity and every happiness end of dinner speech read by john greenman this is section 66 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech dinner for judge robert a pryor astor house new york october ninth eighteen ninety read by john greenman i have often wondered how after dinner talkers such as we have heard tonight manage to make such clever impromptu speeches my impromptu speeches are all carefully prepared in advance but i can't understand how these other fellows manage the thing now there is doherty he gets up with all the confidence which is generally inspired by the preparation of a month and he talks just as nicely and smoothly as though he had never thought about the matter before when he comes to a place to heave in poetry he heaves her in and when it is time for a story it comes right out i am not so much surprised about depew he once asked me how i managed my impromptu speeches and i told him i taught him the art and i sometimes wish i hadn't henry george appears to have a faucet concealed somewhere about him and he just turns it on and out the stuff flows there has been a good deal of war talk here tonight and i don't appear to have been considered in it i was in the confederate army i was in it for two weeks if pryor had to fight through the whole war to get a position as judge i suppose that considering the difference in our abilities if i had fought four weeks i would have been made president and if i had fought six weeks the war would have ended i am not much of a talker upon this kind of an occasion you ought to allow me a discount a few days ago i called at the office of george putnam the publisher i was met by a very severe-looking clerk who told me that mr putnam wasn't in i knew that wasn't true but i didn't blame the young man for 
I don't think he liked the look of my clothes. But I thought as long as I had paid him a visit, I would do some business with him, and I said I wanted to buy a book, a book of travel or something of that kind, and he handed me a volume which he said would cost three dollars. I said to him, I am a publisher myself, and I suppose you allow the usual publisher's discount of sixty per cent. The young man looked absent-minded, but said nothing. Then I remarked, I am also an author, and I suppose you allow the usual author's discount of thirty per cent. The young man looked pale. I addressed him further. I also belong to the human race, and I suppose you allow the usual discount to the human race of ten per cent. The young man said nothing, but he took a pencil from behind his ear and made an arithmetical calculation, and remarked, After adding to that five per cent discount for natural shyness, I find that the firm owes you fifteen cents. So, gentlemen, if you allow me on my impromptu speech all the discounts which are properly due me, I think you will find that besides this dinner you are indebted to me about fifteen cents, and I hope the hat will be passed around and the amount collected. End of Dinner Speech Read by John Greenman This is Section 67 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Dinner Speeches Lotus Club Dinner for Mark Twain, New York, November 11, 1893 Read by John Greenman I have seldom in my lifetime listened to compliments more felicitous, nor praise so well bestowed. I return thanks for them from a full heart and appreciative spirit, and I will say in self-defense that while I am charged with having no reverence for anything, I have a reverence for a man who can say such things as your genial president, and I also have a reverence, deep and sincere, for a club that can confer upon one so confessedly deserving such distinguished tribute of respect to be the chief guest on an occasion like this is something to be envied and if i read human nature correctly to-night i am envied i am glad to see a club in these palatial quarters I knew it twenty years ago when it was in a stable, and later when it was in a respectable house, but nothing so fine as this. I am glad to see it is renewing its youth, and I hope it may be continued to the end, and I hope I shall be there. Now, when I was studying for the ministry, there were two or three things that struck my attention particularly one was that unfortunate procedure that was introduced with the first banquet recorded in history and which has been universally followed down to this present moment i refer to the annoying custom of making the guest of the evening hop on his feet first in the first banquet recorded in history that other prodigal son who had come back from his travels as i have done was notified to stand up and say his say well, that was unfair if he had been left alone until his brethren david goliath and uh, the rest of them had spoken and if he had had as much experience as i have had he would have waited until those other people got through talking. We know what happened. 
he got up and testified to all his failings he gave himself away now if he had waited before telling all about his riotous living until the others had spoken he might not have given himself away as he did and i am afraid i shall give myself away if i go on uh, my history is plenty well enough known already i never wish to add anything to it now that you know how i feel about this matter i will sit down and give the others a chance if they talk too much then i will get up and explain and if i cannot do that i'll deny it ever happened besides i don't feel well enough to talk any more i have been in training with the democratic party and the events of last tuesday have sort of undermined my political health you can imagine i don't feel very robust i feel as i do when i see one of those weak-minded young ladies with an extra charge of poetic soul towing a pup around the street when i translate that pup's feelings i feel that in that pup is concentrated the democratic party that ought to be a good excuse now if i may beg your permission i would rather sit down and wait until i find out whether i am a prodigal or a fatted calf after talks by warner dana seth lowe mccalway and general porter some of whom mildly joked the guest of honor there were loud calls for mark twain who made his second speech of the evening i don't see that i have a great deal to explain away i have got off very easily indeed considering the opportunities these gentlemen have had neither mr warner nor president lowe said anything that i can object to but i never heard so many uh, lies as mr mccalway told you i consider myself a pretty capable liar but when he got through i was more than gratified to see how many things he hadn't found out i have been on the continent of europe for two and a half years and i have met many americans there i tell you it is very gratifying that wherever you find americans in europe they have in almost all cases preserved their americanism the american abroad likes to see the flag of his country he likes to see the stars and stripes fluttering proudly in the breeze in those two and a half years i met only one american lady to be ashamed of that is a very good record that woman glorified monarchical institutions and lauded titles of nobility she was entirely lost in them she kept on until it was plain to me that she had forgotten such a country as the united states and such a flag as our flag finally when i could stand it no longer i said we have at least one merit we are not as china is the lady replied that she would like to know what the difference was i answered china forbids a dissatisfied citizen to leave the country thank god we don't i was born a mugwump and i shall probably die a mugwump this selection merely proves what i have contended abroad i have said there that when europe gets a ruler lodged in her gullet there is no help for it but a bloody revolution here we go and get a great big emetical ballot and heave it up end of two dinner speeches read by john greenman
This is section 68 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dinner Speech Dinner for Brander Matthews, New York, circa December 1893. Read by John Greenman. You have spoken of him well, and lovingly, and heartily, and given him the praises which he has earned, and which are his right. But you have overlooked what I think is the most notable achievement of his career, namely, that he has reconciled us to the sound of his somber and awful name, namely, Brander Matthews, his blighting and scathing name, Brander Matthews, his lurid and desolating name, Brander Matthews, Brander Matthews, makes you think of an imprisoned god of the underworld, muttering imprecations and maledictions. Brander, it sounds like the mutterings of imprisoned fiends in hell. Brander, Matthews, it is full of rumblings and thunderings and rebellions and blasphemies. Brander, Matthews, the first time you hear it, you shrivel up and shudder and say to yourself that a person has no business using that kind of language when children are present. Brander! Why, it was months after I knew him before I dared to breathe his name on the Sabbath day. It is a searching and soul-stirring sound, and makes the most abandoned person resolve to lead a better life and on the other hand when the veteran profane swearer finds all his ammunition damp and ineffectual from long exposure how fresh and welcome is the dynamite in that name brander matthews you can curse a man's head off with that name if you know how and where to put the emphasis to have overcome by the persuasive graces, sincerities, and felicities of his literature the disaster of a name like that, and reconciled men to the sound of it, is a fine and high achievement. And this the owner of it has done. To have gone further, and made it a welcome sound, and changed its discords to music, is a still finer and higher achievement, and this he has also done. And so let him have full credit. When he got his name, it was only good to curse with. Now it is good to conjure with. End of dinner speech read by John Greenman.